Brothers and sisters in Christ, good morning. Welcome to worship at Maranatha Church this morning, whether you're here in person, further out. I don't read sign language. Move it in. Is that better? All right. Whether you're here in person or watching us online, or maybe you're watching us online uh, after the fact, we're glad that you are here to worship with us um, on this holiday weekend. Later, we are going to sing uh, O Canada together to thank you, God, for this great nation of ours. Um, as we begin our time together, let's still our hearts and let's pray. Our great God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit, we come before you this morning filled with praise praise that you have brought us through a week. Perhaps some of us come this morning with gratitude. Perhaps some of us come here this morning with heavy hearts, with needs in our personal lives and in those of the lives whom we love. But this morning, we are sitting here or standing here in this sanctuary and we remember the words of the psalmist that said, I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so, so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this morning, may all that we say and do, in times of silence, in times of prayer, in times in your word, may you receive all glory and honor and praise. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's join our voices in singing our opening song this morning, The Solid Rock.
let us join our voices responsibly, uh, resp yes, in responsively, thank you, uh, in our call to worship this morning from the book of Isaiah. Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength every morning, our salvation in time of distress. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with his justice and righteousness. He will surely the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear these words as God blesses us and greets us this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God, to whom be glory now and forevermore. And all of God's people say together, amen. Please be seated. We now come to a time of confession in our service this morning. So let's pray our prayer of confession this morning. Let's pray. Holy God, we live in a land of abundance. We have food, shelter, and social safety nets for which we are especially grateful this year. Yet with all this, we often complain about the things we think we don't have. We too often take these blessings for granted and forget to our express our gratitude to you. Forgive us and help us to appreciate what we have so that we may focus our attention on you, your will, and your good news, and lead us to what you would have us to do. Make our country and this world a better place for all. Through the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord, hear now our silent prayer of confession. Hear this as God declares us forgiven of our sins. On the basis of the gospel of Christ, you may be assured that our sins are forgiven for the sake of Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Take hold of this forgiveness and live. The peace of Christ be with you all. And let's sing our, let's sing our next song together in Christ alone.
This morning, as we consider God's will for our lives, let us look at the book of Galatians, chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. And in my Bible, it's titled, Life by the Spirit. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for your entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or it will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, 
fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. In this week to come, let us so live out these fruit of the Spirit and avoid the fruit of the flesh, so to speak, and so show, so show ourselves to be Christ's disciples. Amen. Would you all join together with me in prayer? Let us pray. Father God, we once again come before you with great praise this morning. We again praise you for this nation in which we live, in the freedom that we even have to come into a place of worship and worship freely. For there are indeed places in the world where Christians risk persecution and even death just by proclaiming your name. And so, we are thankful. We thank you for the ease we have in medical care and finding resources to bring us through day-to-day -day life. Sometimes, even when we struggle to put food on our table, for those who have less means than others, there are resources, and so we are grateful. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you came into this world and you gave yourself willingly to be crucified for our sins so that one day we may have life through you. Holy Spirit, Thank you that you blow fresh into our lives every day to guide and direct us. We do again come and repent. Father, there are times when we are angry and bitter and resentful about situations in our lives. When the government doesn't do things that we like or when a politician says something we don't like, it's easier to just be angry and bitter. In this time of strife in our own denomination, we can choose to be angry and bitter. So Holy Spirit, lead us and choose, help us choose to not be angry. And so we repent this morning. This morning, we come and intercede for those who need a touch from you, God. Those who have physical challenges, those who have emotional needs, those who are dealing with broken relationships, those who have family members from whom they are estranged. And again, we do pray for our church denomination. We pray for our synod that just happened. We pray for the divisions that still exist. And so, Father God, we pray that you, Holy Spirit, would continue to guide and direct us. Father, there are needs in this congregation that are perhaps unspoken, except in our hearts. 
And so we take a moment in silence to pray for those who are on our own hearts and who need prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this morning we give our very lives to you in spirit and truth as an act of love. May all the rest of what we say and do this morning bring you all glory and praise. For all this we pray in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's once again join our voices in singing as we sing, I Surrender All. Let's rise up and through the words of this song, surrender our hearts and our ears to what we will hear the pastor preach. Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence. So our scripture passage this morning comes from the book of 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, I've entitled my message this morning, Professor Peter's Math 101. And before I actually read our passage this morning, let me start with this thought. So if you were here a few months ago, we had hung our hat when I was with you. We hung our hats in the book of 1 Peter for a few weeks. And so now here we are in 2 Peter. 
Now, those of you who have got to know me well over the last little while will know that I'm a linguist. I love words. I'm a wordsmith. I play Scrabble competitively in tournaments. Languages are my forte. Math, on the other hand, not so much. Basic arithmetic, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, sure. Fractions and decimals, how to add, subtract, and multiply fractions, okay. How do you divide, how do you divide fractions? Invert and multiply. But then we get to algebra, and we added x's and y's into the mix, and I got lost pretty quickly. I tutor mostly French at an after-school tutoring center. And one time I was asked to help a student with math. And she was doing fractions. Fine. But as soon as she got to algebra, I could not help her. I had to pass her off to another tutor. When I was in grade nine, after that, I struggled to get a C in math. I enjoyed geometry enough in grade 10, but after that, I was absolutely lost. Now, when I was in high school, if you wanted to go to university, you had to do grade 13, which doesn't exist anymore. And you needed six grade 13 credits to get your grade 13 diploma. And my high school was so small that if you didn't take any maths and you take, didn't take any sciences, you weren't getting your six grade 13 credits. So I had to take the easiest one of the three, functions and relations, and I ended up with 55, and you needed 50 to pass. So this morning, maybe if you don't do well in math, my title, Professor Peters Math 101, well, it might not seem too daunting. We're only dealing with basic addition, right? Well, it's not so basic. It's not going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination. So if you have your Bible with you, I would invite you to look with me at the book of 2 Peter, and we're going to read from verses 1 to 11. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and righteousness. Through these things, he has given us every great and precious promise so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to your goodness knowledge and to your knowledge self-control and to your self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities increasing measure, they will help you help keep they will sorry, they will keep you from being ineffective and improductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The grass may wither and the flower fade, but the word of God endures forever. Would you pray with me? Lord, bless your word through your servant to your people, for your glory, in your world. Amen. All right, so before we begin this, be, begin this morning and we dig into our text, let me give you some background. This is important. 
I hope this will help us put our puzzle together. Peter's first epistle, he stated that he was writing to Gentile believers, i.e. not Jewish, from across Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey. And in 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, chapters 1 and 2, we read that he said, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, hold on to that. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Peter is writing his second epistle to the same people. Now, I'm not going to go through, too, through this too much here, um, but in 2 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 1, we read, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. All right? Joseph's ADD is going to kick in just for a moment here, and I'm going to go off on a bunny trail. Although Peter's audience was the same in 1st and 2nd Peter, the topics are very different. And actually the vocabulary and tone are very different as well. So different in fact that there are historians and theologians that dispute whether Peter even wrote 2nd Peter at all. Matter of fact, 2 Peter was the last book that was accepted as part of our canon all those centuries and millennia ago. Add to this that there are so many similarities between 2 Peter and the small book of Jude, which follows it, and that some verses being actually verbatim, and if time allowed and we were having some kind of adult Bible study, we could study them, such as warnings of false teachers and such, some would say that either one or the other copied or borrowed material from the other. Jude, after all, identifies himself as a brother of James, hence a brother of our Lord. You know, Peter and Jude likely knew each other. They likely hung out with each other. So whether or no, and even if it is a different audience, it's perfectly plausible that they would write about the same kinds of topics and things. The very last verses of Peter's first epistle tell us that Silas served as Peter's secretary for his first, Peter, first epistle. We don't know if that's the case in Peter's second epistle. We're not told. Again, again noting the different vocabulary and it's much more scholarly, maybe not. But we don't know who did. Peter's just an uneducated fisherman. So it just led other people to dispute who wrote Second Peter. All right. End of my bunny trail. Be that as it may, the letter is attributed to the Apostle Peter and it bears his name. All right. There, I've set some background for us. So let's dig in. Peter identifies himself as both a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, he only identifies himself as an apostle. But here in 2 Peter, he adds the word uh, um, servant as well. Okay, so don't get too intimidated. But I do have to throw in a little bit of Greek here for you this morning. This is a math lesson. It's not a Greek lesson, I promise. But there are at least two words for servant in the Greek New Testament. One is diakonos, from which we get our English word deacon. So deacons in this church, you are servants, called to serve here in this congregation. But that's not the word that Peter uses here. Instead, he uses the Greek word doulos, which is translated as slave or household servant. Jude also uses this word for himself. And in the book of Philemon, Onesimus was a runaway slave of Philemon, mentored by Paul, same Greek word, doulos. That's how Peter saw himself. 
So it's not a pejorative negative term. There was an honor in being called a doulos, a slave of Jesus Christ. In fact, if we were to look at the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, the Greek word for both the Greek word used for both Moses and David, they were both called doulos of God. And in John's Gospel, chapter 15, Jesus tells his disciples that they are no longer slaves, doulos. But now they are friends. Being called a doulos was not a negative word. And so Peter goes on. He tells his readers, and these are Gentiles, I remind you, that because of God's righteousness, they are now every bit God's people. The end of verse 1 says, they have received a faith as precious as ours. As ours, referring to Jewish believers. It took Peter a long time to be comfortable with that, let me tell you. In the book of Acts, chapter 10, Peter was called by a Roman centurion, Cornelius, therefore a Gentile, to dine with him. And, and, and Peter was hesitant. And the passage tells us that Peter has a dream, and a sheet was lowered down to him, and there were four-footed animals of all kinds, and some of them were things that the Jewish law would refuse Peter to eat. And a voice tells Peter, get up, kill and eat. And Peter, being the good Jewish boy that he was, says, no, no, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. But it was revealed to him that God had made them clean. And the vision appeared three times. And so Peter obeyed and went in and ate with Cornelius. And then we read these words in the book of Acts, starting at verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. I realize now how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And then skipping down to verse 44, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And so he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus. And then they asked Peter to stay with him for a few days. The word of God was for now for the Gentiles who came to faith. Peter states this in our passage this morning. And then we get to chapter, verse 3 of our text this morning. And we see that Peter no longer wastes time on pleasantries and preliminary information. He gets right down to business. And in our text this morning, we see three things now, the, the, the one slide that I wanted get transferred in, there they are. God has given Christians all they need to be spiritually mature. Christians must actively pursue spiritual maturity. And three, Christians must pursue spiritual maturity if they expect to be welcomed into God's eternal kingdom. Verse 3 tells us that we've been given divine power in order to have the means to pursue this spiritual maturity. Brothers and sisters, nothing we can do on our own strength can ever accomplish this. Never. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. Well, we might have knowledge, verse 3 tell us, tells us, but knowledge can only take us too far. Knowledge begins when we first begin our relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we realize that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and as an, as an atonement for sin, okay, well, we still, we might begin having some 
knowledge. Let me share this anecdote with you. Now, in some CRC congregations, children are allowed at the Lord's table, and some are not. When I was a member of, at Cross Point CRC in Brampton and was on council, uh, they do allow children at the Lord's table. And while I was there, a, a, two parents came forward um, to the council, and they believed that their eight-year-old daughter was ready to partake in the Lord, at the Lord's Supper. And so two of the elders met with this girl without her parents present, and it was evident this, that this girl's faith was her own, not just her parents' faith. The elders asked her questions. She hadn't been prompted or coached by her parents. And it was clear that the faith was hers. She had begun to have that knowledge. We go on in our text this morning after that knowledge. And we read in 1 Peter, 2, 1 Peter 1, verse 4, Through these things he has given us every great and precious promise, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Through these things. Oh, what things? What, what's, what's the antecedent for that? Uh, oh, uh, antecedent. What's an antecedent? Oh, grammatical term. Okay, Joseph's back in his, Joseph is back in his element again. An antecedent is the word or phrase that comes before something else that something else harkens back to to tell you what it's referring to. So to these things, does it refer to God and our Lord Jesus Christ back in verse 2? Does it refer to everything we need for life and goodness in verse 3? Or does it mean his own glory and goodness? Well, likely the last of these things. Antecedents typically, not always granted, refer to the closest noun or phrase. So Christ's attributes and divine majesty of moral goodness give believers not only what is needed for glory, godly life, but also very great and precious promises, verse 4 tells us, so that we may escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Peter hasn't even started talking about the false teachings running rampant. That comes in chapter 2 of Peter's second epistle. But Peter is already preparing his readers for what's to come. And when we get to verse 5 in our text, my mind starts to quake a little bit. Here's where we begin Pete, Professor Peter's math lesson. And this is where we learn how we must actively pursue spiritual maturity. But let's not overlook the opening phrase. For this very reason, verse 5 starts. When I read those words, part of me wants to substitute one single word for, for this very reason. And that word is the word, therefore. And I think some of you might know what's coming because I have used this with you before. And if you have, help me out. In scripture, when you come across the word therefore, you have to go and figure out what it's... Thank you. So you see, Peter has given us words in verses 3 and 4. So what do we do with them? We've been given divine power. We've been given knowledge. We've been given precious promises. Therefore, what do we do? We apply it to our lives. And that's when we get to our math lesson for this morning. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. You see, brothers and sisters, are we actively pursuing spiritual maturity? Do we know how? 
what we do now, it's right here. You know, it's, it's kind of akin to a staircase, I think. There are eight virtues that we must pursue. And it's why this morning I wanted us to hear the words from Paul's letter to the Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit compare quite nicely to Professor Peter's Math 101 here. Now, there are theologians out there that would tell us that we have to proceed one to another and they have to be done exactly in this order. But, but, but why? Why should godliness lead to brotherly kindness and not the other way about? Why do we, ha do we have to have self-control before we are to develop brotherly kindness? Well, I, I doubt it. We'll see that in a second. But I do want to suggest that faith is the most important place to start. We do come to faith in Jesus Christ before any of the others. The book of Hebrews tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. With faith, we respond to God's call in our lives, and we come to him through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, next we saw the word goodness. Well, we actually saw that word back in verse 3 of our text this morning. At the end of verse 3, who called us by his own glory... And goodness. The King James uses that word. The King James actually uses the word virtue in that context. And you know what? The same word is used in Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4 and verse 8. Let's look at that just very briefly. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admi admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. The word we read as excellent in the NIV translates as virtue in the King James. Same Greek word. Okay, back to 2 Peter. Next we get to knowledge. And we saw that word in our text this morning already, already as well. It's not the first in Professor Peter's 101 math lesson. It's not the same thing as knowledge that identifies us of when we came to Christ. More likely, it's better to say discernment. How to discern God's will in our lives and how to orient our own lives in accordance with his will. Well, then we come to self-control. Now, in the text, in the book of Galatians, in the fruit of the Spirit, self-control is the last of the fruit of the Spirit, but it comes in the middle of Professor Peter's Math 101. So I wonder, in order to gain spiritual maturity, we must develop self-control, or more accurately, hear me well, we must rely on the Holy Spirit for it. We can do nothing without the Holy Spirit. Because you see, the Greeks of the first century, that is the Gentiles, prize themselves on having self-control, relying on their own strength. They relied on their own feelings. A very dangerous game. My friends, in the months that led up to my own conversion moment, that Easter weekend of 1997, I was far from God. I was relying on my own willpower, well, my own self-control to make it on my own. Just memorize enough scripture, pray enough, an entire checklist, and I would be free from the clutches of my sin. And I failed over and over and over again. Because I wasn't really surrendered to God's will, all I was was trying to make it on my own. But friends, when we rely on our own strength, we're doomed to failure. So we have to keep on pressing in on self-control and rely on the Holy Spirit. Because the next item on Professor Peter's Math 101 is perseverance, or perhaps a better word, endurance. 
You see, it's not a one-on-one. It's not a one-and-done, my friends. We must continually bow before the cross of Jesus, seeking perseverance and endurance. I may have said to you before that in Greek, there are two verb tenses that give a command. One is, do this, go here, come there. And then the other tense of Greek to give a command gives a sense of keep on doing such and such, such and such, habitually do such and such. And that's what we have to do here. We must continually bow before the cross and seek perseverance and endurance. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, and in verse 1, we read these words. Sorry. Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, uh uh-oh, I won't go there. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. You see, there it is. We have to keep on going with perseverance and endurance. It says, marked out with, and let us run the race of perseverance marked out for us. Endurance, perseverance over the course of our whole lives. Well, Second Peter, godliness is next. So um, why would godliness be in the middle of this and not the beginning? If these eight items are to be done in order, well, why would godliness be in the middle? That wouldn't jibe with me. And godliness is also a word we saw back in verse 3 of our text this morning here. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him called us through his glory and goodness. So why is godliness in the middle? Godliness is something we can't attain on our own. It comes from God himself. We've been given power, remember, back in verse 1. But we have to continue to pursue it as part of our spiritual maturity, which we saw on our screen up there. Friends, are we pursuing spiritual maturity? I sure wasn't. But God grabbed hold of me that Easter weekend in 1997. Then I knew, or at least I started to know, then I started my spiritual maturity. I hadn't attained it to full, but that's where it started. And friends, and here I'm going to speak to those of you who are younger than I am in the room this morning. I hope that you never have to go through what I did before God grabs a hold of you. Seek godliness now. Don't wait until you hit rock bottom as my friends in 12-step programs would call it. Start your spiritual discipline and road to maturity now. Don't wait. Well, that takes us to the last two items on Professor Peter's math list, brotherly kindness and love. I put them together because both of them really mean love. And I put them together because... The Greek word for brotherly kindness is Philadelphos, from which we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love in the United States. You see, here in this room, we all share brotherly love with each other, that Philadelphos with each other. You know, that's that's the easier of the two words for love. But then there's the Greek word agape, true Christian love. Do we have agape for each other? I hope and pray that we do. When Jesus asked Peter three times in John's gospel, chapter 21, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He didn't say, Simon of John, do you philos me? No, Jesus said, do you agape me? But Peter's response was, yeah, response was, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I fill off you. Peter didn't say agape. 
Not until the third time. And then Jesus himself switched to philos. But dear friends, agape is the love we are called to have for one another. If we are truly servants, doulos, of our Lord Jesus Christ, then philos and philadelphos is just insufficient. We're called to have agape love, not just for God, the love he has for us, but for each other as well. And I would argue here that the entire order of Professor Peter's Math 101 may not be important, but the love, real agape love, should indeed sum it up. Just as faith is where we have to begin, love is where it needs to sum up. And now, as we start to sum up, we get to the clincher of our math class, and that's the final grade. We cannot and indeed must not be content with a B minus in one of them and a C plus in another and an A in another. Uh -uh -uh. We can't be content until we have an A plus in all of them. Ouch. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Joseph. Thanks a lot. Just thanks a heap. But let me tell you, dear friends, None of us will ever get there. Not in this life. But Professor Peter points us to the ideally idea that we must continually, there is that word again, and through perseverance to pursue our spiritual maturity each and every day of our lives. And in verses 9 and 10 of our text this morning, we read, But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. You see, friends, not to beat a dead horse here, I believe I was ineffective and unproductive in my walk because I wasn't seeking godliness and self-control or knowledge or goodness. In fact... I was nearsighted and blind. Now, nearsighted, I already am. I've been wearing glasses since I was three years old. But blind? More accurately, this Greek word means willfully blind, going around with eyes shut tight. I accepted Christ as Lord and Savior at the age of 15. But... I didn't know what I, was, what I was doing. I'd forgotten that I had been cleansed until that Easter weekend of 1997. So friends, are your eyes open? In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, each of those letters end with the words, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now there, it's hearing that is being stressed. Do we hear what God is saying to us? And for people like my brother Steve back there and I, who both wear hearing aids, we know what poor hearing is like. But here in our passage this morning, it's sight that is stressed. Are we pursuing spiritual maturity in our lives? We have to be able to see with our eyes opened. And finally, before we close... Verse 10 does indeed close with a therefore. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every event, a, a, a effort to confirm your calling and election. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, there's a real therefore, and it sums everything up. It goes all the way back to everything we've been saying. If we do all those things... Ready? Listen. If we do all these things, we're never going to fail, right? That means we'll never sin again. None of us will ever sin ever again, right? Please don't fall into my trap. Please say no. No. We are still going to sin in our lives. But because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we are indeed cleansed, verse 9 tells us. But we still have work to do as I read in Galatians 5, there are both the fruit of the Spirit, 
but also the fruit of the ungodly spirit. And verse 21 in Galatians tells us that those people will never inherit the kingdom of God. But we have been called. And so we cannot just sit on our haunches and do as we please. Professor Peter tells us that we have to be eager to make our election sure. And Paul told his, told his readers in Philippi to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Yes, friends, we'll continue to mess up. We will continue to sin. And sometimes we will sin willfully. But as we strive to get an A plus in each of the eight items in our list, we are going to continue through spiritual maturity. Even as we glimpse that glimpse of divine power given to us. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, it's my hope that I have encouraged you this morning to keep our eyes open. Don't settle for a B in Professor Peter's Math 101 class. Don't even settle for an A minus. Grow in spiritual maturity. Our text tells us that we'll re we will receive a rich reward in God's kingdom. And once we have an A plus in each of these and the virtues of our lives and we stand before God in all of his glory, we will hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Amen. Would you pray with me? Oh, Holy Spirit, this morning we have indeed heard words of challenge that we have to pursue righteousness with all our lives. Godliness and peace and forbearance and love and faith. And we are so feeble and we have no idea how to do this. And so Holy Spirit, come into our lives and bless us. Holy Spirit, guide and direct us. Lord Jesus, come and be Lord of all aspects of our lives. We need to hold nothing back from you. May our lives be lives of surrender in all that we do. All this we pray in your mighty name. Amen. We're now going to sing our song of response, The Goodness of God. And I will remind us that our offering this morning will be for the Lighthouse. And it is um, at the back as we, uh, as we go. And then after the time of benediction, I would ask you to remain standing as we sing O Canada and another closing song. But let us first sing the goodness of God. I will see. 
the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear these words of blessing over us as we go on our way. The closing words of 2 Peter in chapter 3. Therefore, Dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory now and forevermore. And all of God's people said together, amen. We sing our national anthem in closing. We acknowledge that we live in a wonderful country. We have incredible freedoms. We also know that we can't place our hope and our trust in those that God has appointed to be over us. Your government party will fail you. Your government officials will fail you. But we actually serve a king who's got the government on his shoulders. And that we find great hope. So as we sing this song, we'll sing our anthem and then we'll close the song with singing about God's faithfulness to us. Because that's really where our hope, our peace, and our joy really is found. See you.
to you right now is your people, the family of God. We talk about brotherly love here in the sermon this morning. And Lord, brotherly love is shown in our love that we have. And, and Lord, this concern brings us together and we bring her to you. We know you are a powerful and a faithful God who cares for us each individually. And so we just bring Mary before you. We just pray, Lord, that you will give her all that she has a need of in this moment and that you will grant her healing and hope and much love care for her and continue to hold her in your hands. We pray this not because we just think you can do the impossible, is we know you do the impossible. Amen. <laughs> 